It's time to talk about Las Vegas with Ira. Each week, Ira David Sternberg talks with the celebrities, entertainers, writers, and personalities who make Las Vegas the most exciting city in the world. And now, here's Ira. What is sourdough starter? And what is Alex White doing with it? Well, plenty it seems. Alex is founder of Yukon Pizza, and along with his team, which includes his wife and brother, produces sourdough pizzas initially at the Vegas Test Kitchen in downtown Las Vegas, and now in the historic Huntridge neighborhood of Las Vegas. For everything about Yukon Pizza, go to yukonpizza.com, and you can follow them on Instagram and Facebook. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So shall we start with the starter? Because I'm going to be one of those people that can admit I never quite know what a starter is. And there's a whole rich family history with this particular starter. But what is a starter? And then how does it apply to baking and specifically to pizza? And then obviously specifically to Yukon? So a starter goes by many names. It can be called a mother, a biga, a poolish. There are a lot of names that bakers and pizza makers use for a sourdough culture that they keep in-house to feed and inoculate their doughs with versus like the instant dry yeast you can buy at the grocery store. So there, there are a couple of different names for it and different kind of methods for keeping it going. But generally what it looks like is a mason jar kind of wet goop. It's just flour and water that's been mixed together years and years and years, over 100 years in our family. So what happens is that the yeast and the bacteria in the air that's everywhere that's around us will land in that sourdough, that little mush of flour and water, and that's what it needs to feed on. So bacteria and yeast love gluten. They love flour. So as soon as they get into it, they start feeding on it and producing carbon dioxide. So that's what produces the, uh, the gassy, bubbly nature of a sourdough starter and a sourdough bread or pizza. Um, so those little guys are our friends. We love the yeast. We love the bacteria that are in our, our sourdough. As we were saying, it's been passed down in my family for five generations now, starting at the turn of the 20th century with the Klondike Gold Rush in the Yukon Territories. The kind of tale that we have is my great, 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 great grandpa. There's too many greats in the line now, but <laughs> it goes back to about 1897, 1900s, and that kind of time, selling you know goods to mining camps, including food and sour to starter cultures to, to let the miners make bread and biscuits in the camps so that having to go back to town all the time. So from there, it traveled down through my family, going from the Yukon Territories to Anchorage, Alaska, Seattle, Washington, where my great-great-grandpa was part of the big rebuilding process after the earthquake there. And then eventually in the Southern California into a tiny mining town my parents grew up in called Trona, California. What was the name of the town in California? Trona, California. Trona. It's very small. Yeah, it's famous for the Trona Pinnacles, where the original Star Trek was filmed with Captain Kirk. So from, you know... My dad's memory of the sourdough is that, you know, his grandpa was making it for him when he was a kid. So going back into the you know, 50s or 40s, we've got my dad remembering really early childhood memories of the sourdough himself. And so when growing up with me and my brother and my sister, are we had the same memories. We have memories of my dad making sourdough pancakes every Sunday morning, my mom making bread and biscuits. And for us, that was that was normal. That was kind of status quo. And as we got older and we started going to friends' houses or kind of venturing out into the world and discovering not every family has a sourdough starter. Not every family has one that's over 100 years old. And so we kind of realized we have a, we have a really unique family heirloom that has been passed down and we've been keeping it going for so long. So when I left for college, my dad handed me my own mason jar of starter and, you know, keep it alive. You feed it and this is what, you know, carry on the family legacy of, of our sourdough. Never did he or I imagine at the time that I would take it and run it so far that now I'm standing in my own restaurant kind of featuring it. But at the time, it was definitely something I really you know, was proud of to have in my, my apartment. And I started throwing essentially parties in my apartment, pizza parties during college to meet friends and girls and drink beer and do all the things you do in college parties. The pizza was kind of a you know a side effect. And then I had a light bulb moment. Uh, maybe in mid 2000s trying a pizzeria here in town called Settebello that had a unique new pollen style pizza that wasn't really hadn't been really around that I had seen yet so I tried it and it was all right how do I make this at home how do I make this style of pizza with my sourdough starter at my apartment and this was probably 2010 so at the time there were very few resources online for home pizza making let alone working with sourdough and your pizza 
how to cook in the, your oven for all the different things you want to do to make a meal column style. So there's a lot of knucklehead research and dough making and going to the library to read baking books. And there was a lot of things I had to kind of really learn on my own. Cause you know, people kind of forget that there wasn't much YouTube or blogs or vlogs or anything like that at the time that really delved into the very niche process of making sourdough pizza. And then after doing a lot of these parties, I kind of just kept it as a side project to my main job. I was, working in the film and TV industry as a cameraman and traveling and doing stuff. And that also afforded me the time and money to be able to throw pizza parties out in the desert. I would find somewhere really south of town or way east of town out in the middle of the, the middle of nowhere, put a GPS pin down, send it out to all my friends on my list and just be like, I got pizzas here in an hour, show up if you want or not. <laughs> um, so they became known as the end of the world parties. And that kind of got become known as a pretty fun thing to go to. And I started getting requests to do catering and private events and weddings and things like that. But did you make them um, also on the sets that you work on as a cameraman? You know, I did not. It was something where it was like the, the methodology at the time. I had to truck around a little portable wood fired oven. I had a whole setup. It was, it was its own job on its own thing. So. Because you could have been your own craft time. table in, in that situation. I could have been my own crafty if they had given me the time and the money, but film sets are tight. <laughs> but I did, it did allow me to talk to a lot of people about it over the years. And so what's great is that the support from my previous industry has been super strong as I've kind of grown into this one. I want to um, ask so a, a naive you, question, yeah. though, about the starter. There are starters that you can start now, and you can, and, you know, or a, they're a year ago or whatever. You have it going back generations. Is there a distinct difference? between a starter that was just started last week and a starter that goes back generations? Is there something within the texture, the taste, or the chemical makeup of the starter that's generationally old versus one that was just started three months ago? There is actually a bit of a difference, especially depending on where you live with it and how much you travel with it. So if you start a sourdough starter right now and you start working on it, let it go for a few months, You'll essentially pick up one strain of bacteria and one strain of yeast. That's really common in pretty much everywhere we go in the world and in the air. I don't have the names off the top of my head because they're long science names, but they all in Bacchus and Thickus and things like that. All those guys, yeah. Um, all the fancy yeast and bacteria terms. But generally, when you start your own starter, you'll pick up one of each of those, and that's what will inoculate your dough, and that's what the yeast part of the sourdough will become. That does take time in order to build up characteristics of that yeast and the, the bacteria you're, you're using in the air. So a very young sourdough starter will come off sometimes a little overly punchy or a little overly sour and very sharp on the nose. And that's just because they're young and they need to be worked with a lot. And part of sourdough starter culture is you have to be very much consistent with it. I, you have to feed it very regularly if you want it to improve and grow. My wife, who is sitting right over here, has endured during when we we're dating me ending dates early because I had to go home to feed the sourdough starter and make dough. And she wasn't buying it until she came to the house and saw that I was, yes, indeed, just making a sourdough starter. In other words, it, was, it wasn't a second date that you had scheduled as actually feeding the, the sourdough. I, I really had work to do. And so it was a thing that she really totally bought into it eventually. And like, it's been amazing. But so with our sourdough starter, because it's traveled so far and so extensively and it is so old, it carries multiple strains of bacteria and multiple strains of yeasts. That allows for like a deeper profile of flavor and character and workability with it. We have our sourdough starter in a really stable spot. We know how it works. We feed it twice a day. So that means we have a consistent product end to end. When you're a young starter, and especially if you're a home chef, it's, some, it's pretty hard to feed it twice a day, if not, not a lot, once a day. And use it every week because it's one of those things that putting the reps in will always make it better, just like any other kind of game or whatever you want to do you you got to put the work in to make the sourdough work so there will be a difference but even a young starter that's been started and fed for three months will still produce great dough as long as the baker is feeding it and being consistent with their process so there's a rumor that i just started that you took the starter on your honeymoon ah well if, if we if only so we got <laughs> married during the pandemic and we have not had an official honeymoon yet so if we were uh, going to try to start a gofundme to send us to italy or something like oh, that. oh nice okay and then you will take the starter with you if you can exactly get some customs. I want to show the how we do it. <laughs> no but it seems to me that when you have this starter you mentioned the mason jar but you can't possibly use it for all the pizzas you make at yukon out of a small mason jar. so how does that oh, yeah, how does no. that what's the process of how does that work how do you so transfer nowadays, it out of the mason jar into something else? So it's uh, like with, with any operation, it's all about scaling up. So the mason jar is kind of something that's just more of that we keep at home for our own house feedings. At the restaurant, we're using five-gallon buckets. 
we do giant feeds that are kilograms at a time. So on average, we're making maybe six kilos of sourdough a day, which is 12 or 13 pounds, and using that to make all of our dough. So we're doing 150 pound batches or so. So it's it's a lot of dough, a lot of mass, but you know we're putting out two or three hundred pizza dough balls at a time, and that'll last us maybe two days. So we're very lucky to have a strong support of people coming through and buying the pizzas. But it's dough making is a very integral part of the process. When you started to scale up, did you take a little bit out of the mason jar and put it into one of these vats or barrels, and then from there scale up? How does that work? I wouldn't overthink with the the mason jar or the starter. That's just just a vessel to hold it, and it could be anything. It could be a deli container. It could be a a tin that you have with a lid on it. I guess what I'm asking, Alex, though, is did you take part of it to initiate the sourdough you're using now? That's a process that happens every day. So that 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 is something that's not like special or extraordinary about when we started a test kitchen right here. Is the sourdough gets fed twice a day, and we just feed it extra water and flour for the next dough making process, and that's. That's all it is really simply. There's not so much like pulling chunks out of one jar and adding it to another. It's just a simple, you know, plastic container that we just add to a more flour and water and let that grow over about eight or 12, 10 hours. And then we can use that to make our dough. Um, and that's just a constantly cycling process. It's, it's every day. You never lose interest in it, do you? There's a bit of kind of magic behind it. So every time that our dough comes out and works, it's a little bit of like, oh my God, it worked again. Thank goodness. <laughs> uh, so it's a lot of, you know, the sourdough is, is it's a wild product. It's its own living organism to a degree. So versus working with active dry yeast or instant dry yeast, which has been processed, commercialized, shrunk down, done the whole thing, you can get a very consistent product out of it, but it doesn't have any depth or character to it. There's no variability. There is, you know, sourdough is really good for the gut biome. It's a, it's a probiotic. The way sourdough works is that it digests the glutens inside the flour. So if you're someone who's gluten sensitive, sourdough is a great option to try because the all the processing of that gluten has been done for you already by the bacteria and the yeast in the sourdough. I mentioned in the opening you started at the Vegas Test Kitchen. Clearly it was successful because now you've opened up your own brick and mortar establishment in the historic Huntridge area of Las Vegas. For those listening outside of Las Vegas, it's a very unique neighborhood. Were you surprised at the initial success in the couple of years you were at the Vegas Test Kitchen? Yeah, you know, it was it, Jolene Manina really gave us an opportunity to establish ourselves and promote ourselves even further than what we were doing from our kind of backyard pizza thing during the pandemic. And the pandemic was the the genesis point for my brother and my wife and I to really commit to the idea of actually launching the restaurant at some point sooner than later. It had been kind of a talk about dream you know, a few years ago, but then when 2020 happens, it really sharpened the focus on like, all right, this is a chance for us to really go after what we want to do with the rest of our lives. We've been all kind of working in previous industries that really eroded our souls and our mental health. And we wanted to do something for ourselves that not only provided us happiness and joy, but we get to feed our friends and family. And so Test Kitchen was the launch pad and the, the incubator space, the the stepping stone. It's, it was one and everything that allowed us to really showcase what we can do with our pizzas, put out quality product every week, bring in customers who've never tried it, let people, you know, see what we're doing, have our chef do special menus where you could show off the food that he's doing in the kitchen, not just pizza. There were so many things about Test Kitchen that really meant that we were able to have the, the opportunities to get in this kitchen that there are too many to list and I, there are too many people to thank, but uh, between Jolene and Jay Dapper, the developer here, we couldn't be more thankful for being in this spot, being in this place, and being open to, the, to our community. Then you have to decide on the menu in terms of the different types of pizzas and other offerings. Do you try to go a little esoteric or exotic, or are you pretty much traditional, but with the exception, obviously, of the sourdough? So we actually are kind of an interesting pizzeria in that like, I do anchor a lot of our pizzas in traditional Neapolitan-style pizza making. That's a different style of dough versus your New York-style dough, which is the big, thin and crispy. But what we did get known for when they were doing pizzas out of our backyard during the pandemic is that we would have kind of eccentric wild pizzas every week. We did a lot of different things. One of what's on the menu now that we've had for almost three years is our last action hero pizza. It's a Mediterranean style pie with feta, red onion, dill, parsley, hero meat. It's an amazing pizza because wrapped up in the, the sourdough, it's like a pita bread and you can't, you can't beat it. There were a lot of, we did a Brussels sprouts pizza, we did a, did a fennel and sausage pie. There was a lot of cool inventive things. We do a, we do a crab rangoon pizza for Christmas. 
So we, we try to have a little bit of exciting things on the menu that are different, very off the wall. But our chef and our pizza making team that we've got built up really work hard to make it a pizza that's not just, you know, like clout looking. It's not like pretty jelly eyes. It also tastes really good. We, we don't have pieces that are just for just for show or Instagram. You know, everything that we make, we really put a lot of thought and care to because is, as much as it looks good at the eyes, it tastes even better when you put it in your mouth and we can't we can't do anything better than just do that. The trick I understand of making a good pizza besides the ingredients you talked about is the amount of time in the oven. You have a specific kind of oven and that you use, and you also are pretty much set, based on what I understand, a, a certain amount of time. It's not going to be forever in the oven once you put that pizza in there. Correct. Our Neapolitan-style pizzas, and like most Neapolitan-style pizzas, they're using a wood-fired oven usually at pretty high temperatures. The way the dough is made is with very little oil or no oil at all, so there's no burning. What you have is just flour, water, salt, and yeast. So with our oven, we have this giant Italian wood-fired oven that we got that we will wood fire and start up early in the morning until about noon when it's ready to go. And so the, the deck of the oven is 800 degrees. The dome of the oven is over 1,000 degrees. So when we fire up a pizza, you're getting it in about two minutes. Amazing. Um, it, it's pretty awesome. And where you're sitting at on our countertop right now is customers can sit here and watch the entire process of the pizza being made. We have a pizza making line right here on the counter that is kind of like a sushi bar. So you can see the dough being opened, the sauce, the cheese pizza maker, putting on the peel, putting in the oven. You can see the process from start to finish of how it's done. And it's very fast. Even when we're busy in service, you can load in five or six pizzas to the oven and we're, we're moving through tickets pretty fast. And we have some very shocked customers who are like, oh, I'll run out real quick and run an errand while you make the pizza. And it's like, don't leave. It'll be done in five minutes. And that's and <laughs> we don't really joke about that. So that's for our Neapolitan style pizzas. And that's what's really kind of what we showcase here. But we also do some New York style slices out of our other oven. And that's a whole different kind of dough and a whole different kind of process. It's interesting because a lot of people assume, as you just mentioned, people want to run errands because they think it's going to be 15, 20 minutes to make the thing. And it's not. It's two minutes. And I think we're all used to those frozen pizzas you get at the store where you put it in there for about 25 minutes and yeah. it comes out. And it sort of tastes like pizza, but it's not quite like that. Yep. Have any of your customers come from Italy to visit you and to sample the pizza? That's actually with the last year that Test Kitchen really uh, showcased us. We had a lot of customers coming from Europe and the East Coast. We, I mean, the several of my favorite compliments we've had is my, my top two were getting pulled over by an Italian who was from, you know, from Naples and saying, this is incredible pizza, reminds me of home. It's very nice and comforting to have that feeling. But probably my favorite was getting pulled over by like a 90-year-old grandma from Brooklyn in a very thick accent telling me that she's from New York. She knows pizza. And this was very good pizza. Well, so if, can't do better than that. Grandma's from New York are happy. I'll take that. So. <laughs> now all you do is have to have Fox's You Bet syrup and have egg creams over there. And what a oh, combination. Oh, man, one day. <laughs> when you put all the ingredients together and you have, as you mentioned, a dedicated staff and team, do you find that... The way you approach making pizzas, well, you know that it's different from most other places that make pizza because of the advantage that you have, or at least the difference that you have. Other pizza makers may say, well, it's different, but it's not better. It's whatever. Who knows? But do you find that in the spirit of what you were talking about earlier, where you all left your jobs in previous industries where the soul was taken out of you, that you find that there's an emotional connection for each and every pizza that you make. I know that sounds a little hokey to some people, but I can see it if you're a dedicated baker, cook, chef, pizza maker. That's a very good question because it's, it's, it's exactly that. Um, my brother and my wife and I especially, like it's, a, it's that kind of driven madness to, to achieve the unachievable of perfection. So every pie is a chance to make the best pizza you can make. Whether it's for a friend that you know is sitting across the bar or for a customer who's never been in before, it's like, all right, I get, I get a new take on on making this pizza. The previous one's already done. It's in the oven. I get take number two, take number three, take number 100 over the night. Every pizza is a chance to, to really elevate and kind of perfect what I've got. And never will we make a perfect pizza. There's no such thing. There are a lot of great pizzas out there. And I would agree with a lot of pizza makers. No one is better than the other. They're just different styles. Everyone does it their own way. Everyone has their own history and story, which is the joy of food and the joy of pizza. We... Get to, I mean, Las Vegas especially is an amazingly great pizza town. We're really lucky to have a world-class selection of pizza makers 
all in a community that work really well together. We're friendly. We, we are comrades in arms and we, like there's no antagonism. It's, it's something that really is special and unique to us. So to be a part of that and to be spreading that joy every day is, is, is amazing. How do you stay so thin eating all that pizza? Uh, you'd be surprised. Well, when you open a restaurant and you're at a restaurant for 16 hours a day, you only eat once. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, we have, you know, we have a, we have a checklist punch list that is a thousand items long. And so every minute that we have, that's not making pizza or working the front counter is, is working on projects. You know, we got the restaurant open. We had a grand opening. We had a really amazing turnout, but now they're just all the little, little things that we've got to still tighten up, you know, on days up and, and when we were going to close, so uh, there's a lot of running around, a lot of thinking and focusing. And I'm very grateful that I have such an amazing team around me. I worked really hard the last few years to build up the people around me because I know it's when I was doing it by myself for all those years, you can only go so far and so fast by yourself before you burn out. You don't like it. You aren't able to achieve the kind of success you want to achieve. So I, I purposely sought out you know, family, but also my chef, Justin Ford, who's a brother in arms who I've known for a long time. And I wanted to develop this group of people that I knew that could take care of every part of the running a restaurant since half of us came from not that business. So my brother is an amazing back office person who runs all our computer and accounting and payroll. And my wife is the red tape bureaucrat, you know, soothsayer. She works with our government agencies to get everything passed and good and going. So if without them, I would still be a guy out in the middle of the desert making pizzas by myself. <laughs> but, um, you know, I had a goal. I had a really big goal and a purpose that I, I, I love working for myself. I love working with my family. I love making pizzas. And if I can do that for the rest of my life, then that's happiness. And I just started it. So I think I'm on the road. How about having pizza making classes in the establishment? Once you get going and you get all that punch list done, what about that idea? Having pizza making classes, I think it would draw a lot of people after hours. So you'll maybe get a second chance to eat besides that one time during the day. What do you think? That's exactly what we have on the plans for next year. All right. So I don't get my commission. Okay. You're going to do the class. Oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, you can come and join the class for free and try it out. Make some pizzas with us. Excellent. But yeah. We, we like, we have, uh, you know, our little black book of future ideas that there's a lot of things we really look forward to expanding our, our business around. So um, a lot of it being education, we love teaching a future round of pizza makers out there. So, we're working with local schools. We have culinary arts programs. We can come in and do demos. Nice. We want to have private classes, you know, corporate lunches, things like that, where we can really showcase the sourdough is not any mystery. And pizza making is not any mystery. I don't have any secrets. Like hide everything I have. I'll share with you. It's just you have to do it ten thousand times for ten years, and then you can kind of be where I'm at. So it's everyone wants to be the uh, the next big pizza maker. You got to put the work in. Yeah, the work and the story. time. Absolutely correct. <laughs> Do you think there's a book in your future? Uh, that's, I have to learn how to read and write first. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm a big sketcher. I love doodling. I'm a big doodler. I actually have thoughts about putting on like a pizza doodle book, you know, something like a little copy book I, I could sell here at the shop. But a book we haven't even talked or thought about. We also have to have free time in order to do that. Oh, yeah. So I thought it might be on the punch list, list, though. <laughs> I, I figured there, yeah, that would be on that. Yeah. Somewhere down number anyway, 122 or something on that list. Yeah, I got to gain I got to gain the wisdom for the next few years and then we'll get something written down. <laughs> now, obviously, your honeymoon was postponed because you are a busy man and your wife is busy also trying to run interference for you when you get this thing up and running. <laughs> so I go back to my original question, which it's sort of half serious, half funny, but if you end up getting a chance to go on a honeymoon, will you take the starter with you, the mason jar? That's a, that's a very good and serious question. I think if it's my honeymoon, I'll probably leave it behind, let the, uh, let the team take care of it so that my wife and I can truly enjoy the, the time. And it was something that we, we loved doing, getting married in the pandemic. We had a little backyard alone. It was really special for us. And when we you know, did it, we also knew very much that the, the honeymoon would be delayed a little while as we got this off the ground. My wife, Danny's more into the pizza game than I could ever have hoped for. She's more in it than I am. And so to have a partner and an ally and someone who has your back during this whole thing has been unbelievable. Uh, so I highly suggest getting that some person in your life if you can for anybody out there. And your chef is Justin Ford. Correct. So yeah, he's another great guy. He's been working in fine dining restaurants to small pizzerias from LA to Vegas, working for big names like Nancy Silverton or Wolfgang Puck. And then all the local chefs around here. He's a guy who's put his hands in a lot of pizzas, put his, his hands in a lot of kitchens and knows, knows his way around a menu. And 
Um, he really treats us nice, treats us well, and helps us really showcase the amazing kind of things we can do out of here. What's the trickiest part about making a pizza for the average person? If they were to try, not necessarily uh, duplicate what you do because you can't, but what would be the trickiest part if you wanted to make a pizza just for people that are trying at home to do the basics? There's a glib answer and then there's, I guess, the real answer. But oh, I could the take both. Part of, yeah. The hardest part of making pizza we always talk about is, is actually getting the pizza onto the peel and off of the peel in the oven. Everything else you can, you can kind of get your way through, but if, if you can't slide a pizza onto the peel and getting it off the peel, then you have a football or a calzone and all of a sudden. That's did, kind you of the the word, did you say the word? Did you say off the peel? P E A L? Yeah. So there's a pizza peel. So we use things like this that help turn our pizza or we launch it. And if you're not able to get the pizza on there or off there, you can have you know, a disaster of the pizza. But really, I think the hardest part about home pizza making, especially, is really just being consistent with your dough making process. And once you really kind of dial in, uh, you have to pay attention to temperature and time. And it's like all these little factors, that's when you can really create an exceptional dough at home. So those are my always first suggestions for people is, is get a thermometer, get a timer, and really pay attention to those two things. Because with a timer and a thermometer, you can make sourdough or, or make any kind of bread kind of anywhere. So that's all you need. Last question. Any expansion plans? I know it's too early because you just opened up this one in Huntridge. But do you think down the road you're going to be opening up additional outlets? Yeah, I, I, back to the little black book of secret plans. We do have plans for expanding. We want to do a second pizzeria that's a little more sit down, dine in, family friendly. We're going to probably push to the southwest. We can find some partnership out there, and then we also have plans in the future for sourdough burger bar concept, like a fine dining concept that Chef could run. That's a little more elevated, focus on food menu stuff. There are a few things in the works, and a few things that we want to try to do. Uh, it's one of those things that we have to start planning now because it, it takes a couple of years for stuff to really start moving. So even though in the midst of all the opening the restaurant and being here all the time, we still have meetings that we're trying to figure out what's the next step. How do we make sure we maintain the growth that we're projecting without kind of falling all over ourselves? So yeah, look for us hopefully in the Southwest in the next few years. Well, thanks. That's a great way to end it. My guest has been Alex White. He's founder of Yukon Pizza. And along with his team, which includes his wife and brother, produces sourdough pizzas initially at the Vegas Test Kitchen in downtown Las Vegas, and now in the historic Huntridge neighborhood of Las Vegas. For everything about Yukon Pizza, go to yukonpizza.com, and you can follow them on Instagram and Facebook. And Alex, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. See you next time. You've been listening to Talk About Las Vegas with Ira. Each week, Ivor David Sternberg talks with the celebrities, entertainers, writers, and personalities who make Las Vegas the most exciting city in the world. Yeah.